Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. We are so glad that you are here this afternoon. And I'm just going to wait uh, about another minute. I can see that our participants are coming in fast and furious. But let's give them just a moment to arrive here with us. And we'll start the webinar very shortly. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for Handling It, Techniques and Materials for Artifact Packing and Transport. This is a program of the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, and it is provided with generous support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, with additional support from Independence Foundation and the William Penn Foundation. Our speaker today is Adriana Province. She's the Registrar at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Adriana oversees the accession and preparation of objects to be treated in the lab, and she coordinates the final steps in packing and return to clients. She's also responsible for tracking objects during their time at the Conservation Center and for arranging insurance and shipping. So this means that Adriana is very often on the move in our facility between the vaults and the storage rooms, the client reception areas, as well as her office. Adriana is also currently the editor of the Sunshine News, which is, oh, I'll share with you, I think in the 31st volume now, mm -hmm. since the staff at the center began remote work and social distancing in the lab. The Sunshine News keeps us all current on the goings-on of the week, and it also announces the cooking challenge, which Adriana is very frequently the winner of. It is a pleasure to hear your voice, Adriana. Hi, you're there, right? I am here, and thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I'm so glad to hear that you love the Sunshine Newsletter. It is definitely a bright spot in every single week. Um, so yeah, it is really keeping us together, and I love um, <laughs> that. Yeah, um, Adriana is um, metaphorically the sunshine in many ways. She's oh. probably the busiest person within the center, um, and also just a pleasure to work with. So I'm really happy to see you virtually this afternoon. It's been a long time since I've seen you um, in person. Yes, um, I am going to turn the program over to you. But I do, before I do that, want to let everyone know that this program is being recorded. So everyone will get a link in about a week to the Conservation Center YouTube page. And there is where you will find the recording for this webinar. If you have any questions during Adriana's presentation, feel free to put them, type them right into the chat box. And Adriana is going to, at the end of the presentation, address the majority of the questions in the chat box, although um, she has already offered to try and keep her eye on the chat box during the presentation. Um, sometimes that can become overwhelming. So if you could just be patient um, until the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A. So Adriana, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I really very much appreciate your kind words. Um, so yes, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for Handling It, Techniques and Materials for Artifact Packing and Transport. My name is Adriana Province, um, and as Stephanie said, I am the Registrar at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia. Um, I have been with the Center since February 2019, and I have over eight years of experience in art handling, packing, and shipping. 
Today, I will be discussing basic techniques and guidelines for handling and packing various kinds of artifacts. And there will be a brief discussion at the end of the webinar about shipping objects during a pandemic, as if there isn't enough to worry about right now, but hopefully I can ease some of your worries. So without further ado, let's begin. When it comes to handling artifacts, the number one rule is to be prepared. There are many things you should consider even before touching an object, let alone packing an artifact. Today, I will guide you through my five easy steps on how to handle it. In step one, I will be addressing conservation concerns for objects and artifacts. What are the warning signs you should look for before handling and packing? In step two, I will discuss the basic practices for handling various artifacts, including works on paper, framed objects, and 3D objects. In step three, I'll share the common tools and materials used in packing art and artifacts. And I'll also discuss which materials are safe to touch your objects and which ones should stay as exterior packing. By step four, we'll be ready to pack. I'll show you the most common packing methods, including flat packing, pinch packing, cardboard collars, soft packing, and box building. Lastly, I'll discuss the final stage of handling it in step five, shipping and transport even during a pandemic. There are a myriad of variables to consider when shipping a packed object, and I will give you some tips on how to do this safely in 2020. Although five steps seems like a lot, these are all basic guidelines that will help you handle artifacts safely and efficiently, hopefully for many years to come. So now that we know where we're headed, let's jump to step one, conservation concerns. What should we be aware of before handling an artifact? What should we do if an object is too fragile to handle, or what if the artifact is actually dangerous? Conservation concerns is step one on our handling journey, as we need to first determine if an object should be handled or packed in the first place. Before handling an object, you should first gather information. If available, consult notes from a previous art handler or conservator. These notes can be incredibly helpful and will often contain handling recommendations and guidelines. For instance, many conservation reports for antique or fragile books note that the book should never be opened past a certain angle to protect the spine. Or they may also recommend using foam wedges to display a book at a certain angle. Art handlers can pass along notes about previous framing or installation issues that this object encountered that would be useful to know prior to handling. If you are receiving a new object, be sure to ask for a condition report or photos before the object has shipped. This will not only help you know what to expect when the object arrives, but it will also make any, any changes or damages to the object more apparent when you unpack it. Stay in contact with your lender and your shipper while the object is in transit and request a tracking number as soon as it becomes available. You will also need to notify the lender when the object has arrived. Finally, you should check the original packing materials if they're still available. Sometimes the packing materials can tell a whole story about how the object fared while in transit. As you can see in the photo here, this box had a rough time in shipping. If you see something like this or any other damage to the exterior packing, immediately take a photo and document it. One should always inspect the packing for tears, holes, punctures, dents, or signs of moisture before unpacking. Is the package cool to the touch or do you suspect it might have gotten wet? If so, look for signs of moisture like cockling or a damp smell as this could be a sign of mold and you should take additional precautions. If you're ever in doubt, it doesn't hurt to whip out a camera and take some shots of the exterior packing and anything else you might notice while unpacking. When in doubt, document it. Speaking of good documentation, condition reporting. Often, a light condition report is a good idea before handling an artifact. Much like consulting a previously written condition report before an object arrives, doing a quick condition report in person will help you get to know your object before handling. When doing a condition report, assess the work overall and look for and document any signs of fragility or damage so you don't risk damaging the object further. You should also determine how the work is matted, mounted, or framed, and be aware of any potential issues in this area that might affect the way you handle or pack this artifact. Does this object have a broken frame or failing hinges that could get worse with handling or shipping? 
Lastly, be aware of exposed edges, possible flyaway papers, or sensitive areas like handles, lids, or split edges that may require special handling or assistance. Hazardous materials and red flags. While some objects might be inherently fragile or delicate, others might be outright dangerous to both the artifact and your health. Any artifact with these red flags should be assessed by a conservator immediately. Up first is mold, our good old friend mold. Look for any multicolored staining, dampness, a musty smell, or visible mold growth. Mold can be damaging to the lungs and sinuses and can quickly spread to other objects in your collection. Fire damage. Look for signs of soot, a smoky smell, brittle edges, or burns. Items that have been around fire can be incredibly brittle and handling is not advised until the object has stabilized or has been stabilized. Water damage. Check to see if the object is cool to the touch or still damp. Also look for any cockling or water lines. Water damage can quickly lead to mold, so be extremely careful around objects that were previously wet. Pets damage. Look for signs of droppings, urine stains or odors, bites or gnaw marks, dead or still living insects, and pest eggs. Pest droppings can be hazardous for your health and other signs of pests can be damaging for your collection. They could also be an indicator of a much larger infestation problem. Lastly is the exciting other category. This includes dust, powders, flaking, blood, heavy metals, radioactive materials, etc. Do as much research as you can in advance before handling any of these objects with red flags. Here is an example of an object with active flaking. Be extra cautious around these fragile sections to avoid additional media loss. And here is an example of a book with active mold growth. Be sure to wear an appropriate mask or respirator for mold spores before handling it further. And when in doubt, contact a conservator. A conservator will be able to assess the potential health risk associated with your object, and they can determine if an artifact is stable enough to be handled. If you do encounter an object with one of these red flags, immediately don the appropriate personal protection equipment or PPE for that type of hazard. Common PPE includes nitrile gloves, an N95 mask or respirator, and disposable aprons. If you're unsure which PPE is appropriate for your specific hazard, consult your hazardous materials policy. If you do not have a hazardous materials policy, now is the perfect time to create one, especially if you've been working from home, make one. <laughs> do your research and consult reputable sources like the American Institute for Conservation for up-to-date guidelines and procedures. Lastly, if you have any concerns or uncertainties, do not handle the object until you've talked to a conservator. In these instances, it's better to be cautious than risk your safety and the safety of your artifact. Now that we've discussed how to assess an object, ooh, how to assess an object before handling, let's now jump to step two, best practices for handling artifacts. Before you begin, you must first properly prepare your workstations and yourself for handling artifacts. First, make sure your workstation is clean and clear of other items and always have a designated area for your landing objects. Next, never have food or drinks around an artifact. Pests are attracted to even the tiniest crumbs and you risk staining or damaging objects when food or drinks are around. Whenever you feel like you don't need to state this anymore, someone will try to sneak a piece of Halloween candy and you have to reiterate this rule once more. No matter how cleanly you eat, it really isn't worth the risk. So always make sure your workstation is crumb and spill free. Next, make sure all jewelry, keys, lanyards, belt buckles, scarves, or pocket pens are elsewhere. You wanna mitigate the risk of an item falling, scratching, or damaging your object while you're handling it. It is also a good idea to tie back long hair to keep it off your artifact. Next, make sure your hands are thoroughly washed and completely dry before handling an object. With the increased use of cleaning solutions and hand sanitizer around the office, 
These materials can damage certain artworks. So wash your hands with soap and water before handling anything. Lastly, you should always have a plan in place. Objects should be handled as infrequently as possible to minimize risks. So creating a plan in advance will ensure your object is safe. Be sure to only handle one object at a time and ask for help if you need it, especially if an object is large or heavy. If you do need help, communicate your plan with your colleague in advance to avoid mishaps. When preparing your workstation, you should also consider what materials you need on hand to do your condition report or document your work. The most essential items include a micro spatula to gently lift edges of a flat object, a bone folder to make corners or folders, and a pencil. When working your objects, only use pencils and never pens. Ink can easily stain your hands and artifacts. Also, never use post-it notes or other self-adhesive materials near objects. Make sure all tapes and adhesives are far away from your landing space to avoid sticky accidents. Next, don't lean on collection materials or take notes on their surfaces. If you need to write in pencil on a storage box or folder, do it before the object is placed inside. Lastly, do your best to protect your artifact from light while working. It's easiest to do this by simply keeping your object in its closed storage box or folder when it's not being handled. Light can fade an object surprisingly quickly, so do your best to mitigate fading while working. Oh, and I see a wonderful note in our chat section from Marie, um, who says at their institution, annual training is required for using PPE, particularly N95 masks. Um, she is absolutely correct um, that unintentional misuse can cause a false sense of security. Um, so make it a priority at your institutions or in your lab to make sure that everyone knows which a PPE is appropriate and make sure that it fits properly. So now we go on to the age old question, to glove or not to glove? Gloves, ideally nitrile gloves, are recommended when handling photographs, framed objects, gilded frames, and 3D objects. Photos in particular should always be handled with nitrile gloves to protect the emulsion from the oils on the hands. Paper, on the other hand, tends to be more delicate and will often require a gentler touch and more dexterity. Because of this, we recommend using clean, bare hands when handling paper artifacts and documents. If you are going gloveless, we also recommend not wearing nail polish as it can sometimes leave marks or scuffs on paper objects and mats. Many art handlers used to use cotton gloves, but they are now a less popular option. Cotton gloves restrict dexterity, absorb moisture, and can easily become as dirty as fingers or hands. The fibers on cotton gloves can also snag or tear paper, so clean hands are a, are a preferable option. One artifact at a time. You always handle only one artifact at a time. Artifacts should be handled as infrequently as possible. And to help with this, use carts, folders, and boxes to carry objects from one location to another. When relocating objects, do your best to move as smoothly and as carefully as possible to avoid vibrations that could aggravate delicate media. If you have the option, take an elevator instead of the stairs if you must move an object between floors. If you do have to use the stairs, do so with extreme caution. Lastly, always use both hands to move an artifact. If an object is large, heavy, or very fragile, do not be afraid to ask for help. The safety of your object should be your first priority, so asking for help when needed is the best policy. Just be sure your colleague is wearing a mask and socially distanced as much as you can. Mats and hinges. Hinges are used to suspend an artwork within a window mat. If a piece is matted, check the direction of the hinges before lifting or handling the object. Also, you should always orient an object so that the hinges are at the top, um, so that the piece is hanging from the hinges as intended. Carrying a matted work upside down could cause the hinges to fail and the object to slip. When packing, make sure the object is packed in its correct orientation to reduce the risk of failing hinges. Handling paper. 
flat paper should be gently lifted at the edges or corner to corner. It should also be supported so that it is not creased. Use a micro spatula or thin cardstock to lift thin brittle paper edges or thin brittle paper at the edges before moving. Be sure to hold the edges gently with both hands and do not pinch or grab the paper. Seriously, do not pinch. <laughs> Lift gently with the fingers and do not grab with your fists. And this is another friendly reminder to just make sure to wash your hands first and to have them be completely dry. When handling paper, place fragile documents on an archival surface like mat board, blotter, or on a flexible non-woven polyester film like Holotex for additional support when handling. Documents can be turned more easily this way. When using rigid folders as temporary storage while moving or packing, the artifact or document should be near the fold of the paper where it is less likely to move around in the folder. This is especially important for fragile and sensitive works as it helps to minimize unnecessary contact. You should also always open folders carefully as some lightweight artifacts can lift with the folder slab when you open it. Opening a folder slowly and carefully will ensure that your object stays in place. Also, you should be aware of the airflow in your surroundings. People walking near your object or even the air conditioner turning on could cause a light paper artifact to lift and fly off of your workstation. To prevent flyaways, use smooth weights to keep papers in place. Also, be careful when handling full sheets of cardboard or buffer board as they could cause unexpected gusts when moving. Large flat documents like oversized prints, drawings, maps, and architectural blueprints should always be supported on a rigid piece of map board or buffered alkaline board larger than the object. If you need to access, if you need to access the back of a paper artifact or the verso side of it, it should be placed in between two boards and tightly held together while flipping. Never flip an object by yourself and only use trained staff to turn or flip large objects. Once again, have a plan in place and communicate the direction you will be flipping in before picking up the piece. Fragile folded corners, fragile folded papers should not be unfolded by anyone other than a conservator. If an object becomes damaged during handling, do not attempt to repair it. Leave the piece in its current condition until a conservator can assess it. When working with charcoal or pastel drawings or paintings, keep the objects flat and face up. Nothing should ever touch the surface of a charcoal or pastel artwork. Charcoals and pastels always have some risk of loose media, so be sure to avoid touching the surface or causing any unnecessary vibrations. Now that you know how to safely handle paper artifacts, let's move on to frames, paintings, and 3D objects. Before picking up a frame, you should first examine the frame structure. Old frames could be damaged or have weak spots from previous repairs. Gilded or ornate frames are especially fragile because the plaster may be weak or flaking. Sometimes canvases aren't even properly attached to the frame and are at risk of falling out. Ah. When lifting a frame, always lift with two hands from the bottom or on both sides. Never grab onto a spot that looks weak or shows active flaking. Also, keep an eye on the frame joints as you lift to ensure the frame has not shifted. When handling frames, the glazing should face towards you. Glazing is the acrylic or glass used to protect framed objects from environmental factors like humidity, heat, light, and UV discoloration. Avoid touching the glazing as much as possible and do not lift a frame that has broken glazing as this could damage the artwork. Keep frames flat when possible and when upright, keep the object in its hanging orientation, never upside down or sideways. When setting down a frame, always do so slowly and carefully so you don't damage the corners and keep it protected from the light whenever you can. A frame, carts, and book carts. Carts and blankets are great tools for moving framed objects. 
Carpeted A-frames are used to move paintings on a slight angle for stability while keeping them upright to support the media inside the frame. Soft carpeted carts and carpeted feet are great for protecting frames and help prevent objects from being scratched or dented by a hard surface. While using a carpeted cart, be mindful of the possibility that items can sometimes slip on carpet. Straps are used to secure objects to an A-frame, but framed edges are usually covered with filara or a blanket first to prevent scratches. If you're moving smaller items like books, a book cart or a book truck is an excellent option for moving multiple books from one location to another. Just ensure that they are securely placed on the cart so nothing is at risk of slipping off while it's moving. Before using a cart, make a plan and measure your route. Will you encounter a narrow hallway or elevator? Or will you potentially be near a lot of people? Measure your object to make sure it'll fit on the cart or A-frame and also measure your hallway and elevators. It's even necessary sometimes to request an escort to politely shoo people out of your way while you safely cart your artifacts between locations. The last thing you and your object need is to be stranded or stuck because you didn't measure in advance. Also, make sure you only use a cart on a clean and flat surface. If you're planning a collections move in the future, be sure to use your carts wisely. In your collections move plan, determine how many objects can safely fit on a cart, what other materials you will need, like velara, blankets, blocks, etc., and which path is the safest and easiest. Consider these items in advance, or considering these items in advance will make your move much easier and keep your artifacts safe. When working with framed artifacts, never stack frames or lean them against each other. Always use carpeted feet, foam, or cardboard barriers to keep frames separated and cushioned when placed on a cart or on the ground. When using a large cart or A-frame, ask for help. These larger carts tend to get heavy and can be difficult to maneuver by oneself. If you have he any hesitation at all about the weight or size of an object before you move it, ask for help use carts and dollies, and use A-frames whenever possible. When it comes to 3D objects, you have a couple of packing options available. If the piece is large and stable, furniture pads and blankets can be used to cushion an object before it is placed into a foam lined box or commercial bin box with a foam bottom. Smaller objects could be first wrapped in Tyvek, glassine, or archival tissue, and then wrapped in bubble wrap to support it while it's in transit. Small sandbags can also be used for additional stability and support. Never pick up an object from a handle or an appendage and make sure the spot you touched is well attached before lifting. It's safest to pick up 3D objects from the base only if it's secure. Books should only be grasped by the boards or the shoulders and never by the end cap when being retrieved or reshelved. Books should also remain flat when being handled and packed for shipping. A bulky book or fragile material may require a book cradle or a book snake to allow it to be opened with support and without damaging the spine. When packing 3D objects, keep in mind the six directions of travel, left, right, up, down, forward, and backward. Depending on the size and fragility of your 3D object, it may be best to get a storage crate built for safer handling. Wooden crates should also be used for shipping these objects and will often contain internal foam core boxes or trays to easily pack and remove artifacts. Wooden crates are expensive, but ideal for shipping because the well-built crate will provide the best protection for your object. Simple crates tend to be lined with foam for short distances, and painting crates can have internal support frames to suspend an object or canvas in the crate using Oz clips. All crates should still have standard handling symbols on them, including directional arrows, fragile marks, and keep dry notes. If you're shipping a crate internationally, make sure it has a bug stamp, which is a federally required stamp that designates a crate is made out of 100% heat treated plywood and therefore contains no bugs. If you're ever planning on packing or shipping a large, heavy, fragile, or particularly valuable object, it is best to consult a professional art handler first.
The Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts specializes in the stabilization of books, photographs, and documents. In step three, I will focus on the common tools and materials used in artifact packing. Oh, and I see a quick note here um, about Oz clips. Oh, from Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Um, Oz clips are um, little metal brackets um, that actually screw into um, a wooden strainer on a canvas or into the back of some frames. And once they are screwed in, I believe it's Oz clips that are. Um, they can be like permanently affixed in there. Um, the clips are then secured from the back of the strainer to the internal travel frame within the crate. Um, and so it holds your entire object in suspension um, while it's in transit. Um, it's particularly great for um, very for frames in, that are very ornate or gilded or for um, unframed works on canvas. Um, so good question. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so yeah, step three. Um, here we will work from the object itself and move out while packing and discuss which materials are safest to use at each level. Layer one, the object level. Before packing, you need to think about what will come into contact with the object first. There are some tried and true materials that are safe to use at this object level. The first material we'll discuss is holotex and buffered folder scott buffer folded stock. Holotex is a non-woven polyester film that has a good chemical resistance to oxidizing agents, acids, rot, and mildew. It is also incredibly durable and comes in a variety of thicknesses, which make it a popular material for interleaving. 10 point and 20 point buffered folder stock comes in pre-cut folders or as large flat sheets. The buffered folder stock is acid and lignin free and has a pH of 8.5. In my packing explanation later, you'll see a lot of references to 10 point and 20 point folder stock as it is a versatile and safe material for most objects. And it is excellent for making storage folders and flat folders or storage folders for flat objects, excuse me. Alkaline buffer board or archival corrugated board is often blue or gray in color and resembles a smooth cardboard. These blue boards are enhanced with an alkaline substance to raise the pH so that they can absorb or neutralize acids. This makes them an excellent material for long-term storage, and these materials can be in direct contact with the artifact itself. It's not often used as exterior packing material because it's more expensive, um, especially more expensive than cardboard, but it can act as a rigid support for a 20-point folder or as an interior box for a book or photos. Ballara is a soft but dense foam that also comes in a variety of thicknesses. It has a very smooth surface and is specifically designed to come into contact with objects. This archival material can be used as cushioning and support in packing, and it can be adhered to at the foam with a glue gun to protect an artifact surface or frame from abrasion. Glassine is a translucent, water and grease resistant paper with a neutral pH and it is often used as short-term protective barrier for drawings, paper documents, glazing, and prints. It can also be used as wrapping to protect books or storage folders before packing. In the photo on the left, a conservator is using glassine to wrap an object. However, you should be cautious when using it around painted artifacts as glassine has been known to stick to some acrylics and oils if they're not fully dried and cured. You should also be wary of using it with photographs as it can cause deterioration if used long term and it can stick to certain photographs in very high humidity. Tyvek is a synthetic material made of high, high density polyethylene fibers that is most commonly used to wrap buildings under construction. However, archival Tyvek can be purchased from reputable vendors and is even more amazing because it's water resistant, mold resistant, tear resistant, breathable, pH neutral, and has a fabric-like quality, which makes it perfect for packing. I really like Tyvek in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> it comes in both soft and smooth textures and is sold on 60 inch rolls. Tyvek can be used as a moisture barrier and as internal wrapping for artifacts.
The second layer out from the object is the protective layer. Since you previously packed your object in non-reactive archival materials, you will have a few more choices for the protective layer. Our first material at this level is bubble wrap, everyone's favorite bubble wrap. While it's not a very protective material on its own, it can be easily used to fill in empty spaces and act as an initial cushioning barrier. Bubble wrap is inexpensive and it comes in pre-perforated rolls for convenience. Bubble wrap should never directly touch an artifact since it is not archival. Also, the bubble should always, always, always face out to maximize its effectiveness and reduce the risk of dot transfers onto artifacts, but more on that later. The next materi material is polyester film or poly. Thick poly sheeting is used to protect an artifact by helping it maintain the climate in which it was packed. Completely sealing objects in poly preserves the humidity from where it was packed and keeps it stable throughout transit. It is also a great moisture barrier and protects objects from other environmental hazards like rain and dust. Poly is very durable and can be reused, but if you're planning on using it very close to an object, like in conjunction with a cardboard collar, you should only use new or virgin poly to ensure residues don't transfer to the object. Our next protective material is foam. Foam is used for padding, insulation, and shock absorption in packing. It is most commonly used to line wooden crates, but it can also be strategically used in boxes and bins for shock absorption and cushioning. There are two main foams used in packing, ester foam and ethafoam. Unlike Falara, which I mentioned earlier, neither of these foams are considered archival, so they should not come into direct contact with your artifacts. Ester foam, also called char ester, is an open cell foam that is black or dark gray in color. It has a spongy texture and offers good shock absorption. It is also fairly easy to cut, so it can be used to cavity pack smaller objects or act as a lining in cardboard bins or boxes. Oh, and I see a great question from Margaret um, about what tape is best to use with polyethylene sheeting. Um, we are getting very close to my thrilling tape section um, where I will go over just that, but I am glad to know that you are already thinking ahead. Um, next here is uh, ethafoam, which is a dense closed cell foam that is white in color. Because of its dense nature, it feels firmer than ester foam and is more commonly used to provide suspension for 3D objects. It provides a little bit of shock absorption, but not nearly as much as ester foam. So it is best used in smaller amounts as braces or ribs in a crate and in between softer, softer sheets of the black ester foam. When using ethafoam for suspension support, you can attach Valara to it to make it less abrasive if it comes into contact with 3D objects. Oh, and Marie also just asked another quick question. Um, if I could address the roles of static charge of materials when packing. Um, there are some uh, poly sheetings that actually have certain um, films on them to help with static. Um, so if you're using poly sheeting, I would highly recommend purchasing one of those. Um, other ways to try to mitigate static, I will try to answer at the end of the webinar, but good question. Also, as promised, tape. Our third layer out from our protective material is tape. There is a wide world of tapes, so it is important to know which tapes are considered best at our final two stages of packing. For interior packing, there are two low-tech tapes that are commonly used for securing protective materials, painter's tape, and micropore tape. These tapes should only be used to secure protective materials to each other. Never use it directly on an object or archival housing. Blue painter's tape on the left, or masking tape, is a low-tack adhesive tape that is used when adhering portfolio corners as it will not rip glassine or other papers. It is also used to temporarily secure bubble, bubble wrap in some instances. Micropore is a pressure sensitive adhesive tape usually used in medicine to bandage or dress a wound. However, it is soft and gentle and can also be easily removed from glassine. 
Micropore is often used to secure glycine wrapping around smaller items like books or storage folders. Here is my list of most commonly used tapes. Um, and before you feel like you need to frantically scribble all of this down, um, just a reminder that this webinar will be posted to the official CCAHA YouTube channel um, in about a week or so. So just wanted to preface with uh, preface this slide with that. Um, the low tax section on the left includes the painter's tape and micropore tape from the previous slide. These two tapes are safe to use in the interior packaging in order to secure protective materials only. And once again, they should never come in contact with an object or be used at the object level. High tack tapes are in the right column. Most high tack tapes will be used exclusively for exterior packaging and box building. However, ATG 700 tape is used for interior packing to secure photo corners to sheets of cardboard. We'll revisit these high tack tapes shortly in the packing section. Glass tape or glass skin is used to cover an artwork's glazing while in transit in case of breakage. It should never be used on UV glass, museum glass, or acrylic glazing, and it is not always a foolproof method for protection. Even with glass tape, an artwork's glazing could still break and small shards of glass could damage the artwork. If it is carelessly applied, it could damage the glazing and frame of an object, but it is still a valid choice if you're shipping a framed object without a crate, if it's in an unstable frame, or if the object has thin or old glass. When using glass protection tape, the tape should come to one eighth of an inch from the frame and should not directly touch the frame as it could damage the wood or varnishes. All told, if possible, you should try to avoid shipping objects with glass, or if you must, contact an art handler about professionally creating the piece for shipping. Our fourth and final packing layer is the exterior packing. Foam core is a popular choice for exterior packing because it's clean, flat, and lightweight. However, acidic materials in foam core can potentially cause chemical deterioration of photographic and paper artifacts. This could lead to staining, fading, and embrittlement. If you use foam core, do so only as exterior packing and never have it directly touch an artifact. Brown corrugated cardboard on the right. As much as I love and use cardboard, it is a very acidic material. It can cause the same chemical issues as foam core, so only use it as exterior packing and only after an artifact has been sufficiently protected from direct contact with the cardboard. When using cardboard to build boxes or move protected objects, double walled cardboard is always preferred to single walled because of its stability and durability. Mini stretch wrap is my new favorite material because it is very easy to use and it is easy to remove. Your recipient can use scissors to cut through the wrap and then easily open the box without having to slice at the edges with blades. I've been using it to secure lids for boxes um, that will be hand carried and I will often wrap I will often wrap the box in a sealed layer of poly sheeting to act as an external moisture barrier. For boxes that will be shipped via FedEx or UPS, just seal the box with ample strapping and packing tape instead of the stretch wrap, as the stretch wrap get, can get stuck in their sorting machines. Lastly, remember that most packing material is not archival and should not be used as long-term storage. Cardboard is acidic and packing tape becomes yellow and brittle over time. Even glassine can become brittle and can potentially stick to photographs. Here is an example of a degrading packing material of degrading packing materials. So always make sure to unpack your objects promptly upon arrival. Now that we've discussed how to safely handle objects and the materials we'll need for packing, let's get to it. It is time for step four, packing. Oh, hello, Steven. Steven just brought up a very, very good point that when using two pieces of corrugated cardboard for shipping, you should have the corrugations running at right angles to each other. 
Shippers will always find a way to bend the packages otherwise. And Stephen is exactly right. Thank you. All right. When you get to the packing stage, the first thing you should consider is your recipient. What information needs to be included to ensure an easy and safe unpacking? A great way to start is by clearly labeling the package on both the interior and the exterior. People can be very creative when opening a box, so never assume your packing is self-explanatory. Be sure to include notes like face up or this end up to keep the artifact in the proper orientation while unpacking. At the center, we strive to pack objects so they will stay in the same orientation throughout shipping and unpacking. A lot of this is feasible by having clear labels and unpacking instructions and notes. In the large photo, the foam was labeled with direction notes like top and right to indicate where it should go in the case. I later added in instructions like remove this end first to clearly indicate how the recipient should begin unpacking. If the packing is complicated, it is also a good idea to fully type up your packing instructions and attach them to the package's exterior. As I previously mentioned, we want the artifacts to be handled as infrequently as possible. So the clearer the instructions, the easier the packing, and the safer it is for the object. Other helpful instructions include notes about what to do next. As your recipient unpacks, they will encounter multiple layers of materials and sometimes multiple artifacts in the same package. Label the tabs, folds, or boards that they should lift next to safely access the artifacts, and clearly note if another object is underneath something. If you are packing a 3D object or sculpture, you may even need to add handles or number tabs in the order they should be unpacked. You should make it very clear in your unpacking notes or on the package's exterior exactly how many objects your recipient should find in the box and how many total boxes are in that shipment. A concise outgoing loan document or receipt should list all this information as well. The smaller photo here shows, um, I'm sorry, the smaller photo shows this object should be handled, how it should be handled in transit by saying ride flat. And it indicates that this is box one of eight. This is a, there is also a smaller space for listing the accession numbers of each object on that box. And all of these notes are clearly visible and legible. Be considerate of the packing and unpacking environment. To minimize fluctuations in humidity, you should wrap a layer of poly around a packed object and completely seal it with tape. You'll never know for, you'll never know for certain what the weather will be like the day of your pickup or delivery. So using a moisture barrier of some sort is always a good idea. Next, you should always mark whether a box is packed or empty over the package's primary opening. Immediately after you pack or unpack a box, label it correctly to avoid confusion once it goes into storage. Lastly, how will the package travel? You may pack your artifacts a little differently based on how they will be shipped. For example, a private client hand carrying an object probably doesn't need as much exterior packing tape as something traveling via a common carrier shipper like FedEx or UPS. Someone hand carrying the object will hopefully carry it more carefully than FedEx, so it might not need as much internal foam or bubble wrap as well. If an object is especially fragile, valuable, or large, you should reach out to an art handler and have them pack and ship the artifact for you. Also, if you're shipping internationally, Consider including translated shipping instructions and clear unpacking photos with your shipment. On the left is an example of a label I often use in my interior of packing. It acts as a landmark for the recipient and tells them A, exactly when to stop using a blade, and B, how to proceed with the next unpacking steps by unfolding and pulling tabs. It also clearly states that these materials are just for packing and that they should not be used for long-term storage. The second photo here is also telling us not to use blades past this point, but I will admit that it took us a little bit of time to discern that fact. I think the addition of a this end up label here would have helped because we weren't exactly sure what this drawing meant when the package was facing in a different orientation.
And always remember to leave a tape tab. When packing with tape, always fold over one end so you have a little tape tab to grab onto. Tape tabs are great for unpacking because you can easily remove tape without having to rely on knives or blades. So now that you know how to safely handle your artifacts and your packing materials are all nearby, it's time to evaluate your object and measure it for packing. Using the packing, in, using the packing materials information in step three as a guide, you should first determine what should come into direct contact with your object. In this instance, the poster and the gift is a stable 2D unframed object. So a glassine folder or a 10 or 20 point buffer folder would be most appropriate. Here, I used a 10 point folder for this object. When measuring an object for a folder, I typically add on at least a half an inch to each side to allow for some border space. Your folder should always be a little larger than your object and a slightly larger folder will make it safer and easier to handle. Once your object is in its folder, you can pick your packing method of choice. Today, I'll be discussing the most common and most budget-friendly packing methods for safely packing 2D objects. Flat packing, pinch packing, cardboard collar, soft packing, and box building. For 2D objects that are particularly large, valuable, or fragile, or that you need to pack for international shipping, I once again recommend contacting professional art handlers to discuss crating instead. And yes, this is actually me measuring in the animated GIF. Um, it will be me in all of the GIFs, so I really hope you enjoyed them because I had a lot of fun making them. Flat packing. Flat packing is a simple and effective packing method that involves placing an object into a cardboard or foam core folder or portfolio. Flat packing is great for stable, unframed 2D objects. The object should first be wrapped in glassine or placed into a 10 or 20 point buffered folder like in the previous slide. The glassine or folder will act as a barrier between the object and the acidic cardboard. The object is then held in place with photo corners. Photo corners can be attached either with a low tack tape as seen on the left or with a high tack ATG tape as seen on the right. If you use a low tack tape, Make sure the corners open down so that you don't risk getting tape on the internal folder or on the object itself. At the center, I usually attach corners with the ATG, ATG tape, which is the large yellow tape dispenser in the GIF. By using ATG tape, the corners can be opened up and the internal folder can be very easily removed. Having the corners open up also reduces the amount of direct object handling and you don't have to pull away any tape near the object itself. Next up is pinch packing. Pinch packing is great for flat objects in a folder, sealed packages, or most framed objects. You should avoid pinch packing ornate or gilded frames as the cardboard can put pressure on gilding and risk flaking. Pinch packs are easy to do and the exterior cardboard provides flat structural support. Pinch packing is very similar to flat packing, except that you use two separate sheets of cardboard or foam core instead of using one sheet as a large exterior portfolio. As with a flat pack, you'll first place your object into a glassine or buffered folder and then secure it to a sheet of cardboard or foam core with photo corners. I make my corners using 10 point archival folder stock in a bone folder in the GIF here. Once again, the ATG tape is used to secure the folder to the backing board. The backing cardboard should be at least one inch larger on every side than the folder itself. Also, the larger your object gets, the larger you should make your corners. You do not want to risk the object sliding out of its folder because the corners were too small. In the photo on the right, you can see a stack of 10 point squares. These will be important soon, so please keep them in mind. Okay. So this next part is all about how packing tape is really sticky on one side, but it is easy to remove from itself on the other side. The top sheet of cardboard is then placed over the folder cornered object and packing tape is placed on at least four sides of the top sheet. You can see me pointing here. 
Make sure the packing tape is only secured to the top sheet and it should never fold over the sides of the cardboard. So just flat sheets right on the corners or on the edges. Oh, thank you, Joshua, for uh, the very polite note about my overhead tutorial clips. Um, yeah, so once the top tape sections are in place, you'll then attach a longer piece of packing tape to one of the 10 point squares as seen in the previous slide. The arrow on the left is pointing to my trusty stack of pre-cut 10 point squares. The tape should be at least an inch to an inch and a half longer than the squares on both ends. And remember to fold a tiny tape tab on one end of your strip. Then attach the tape tab to one of the tape sections on the board and gently stick the bottom end to the back of the backing board. So you stick it here and then you put it under the very bottom of the sheet. Repeat this on all sides until you have sandwiched or pinched the cardboard sides together. The 10 point squares are necessary as they prevent the tape from getting too close to the object and they will flop open as soon as you undo the tab keeping the tape tab or keeping the tape on the tab and away from the object once it's been opened. The arrow on the right shows where the tab should go for easy opening. Here, so you pull the tab, it flops open, and there is your object. Our next packing method is a cardboard collar. Cardboard collars are best used for framed objects with no glazing. These will usually be paintings, but a collar is useful for any artifact that has a sensitive face or is not glazed. To make a cardboard collar, first measure your object, double those dimensions, add the depth of the frame, and then add on a few more inches for larger pieces. The actual size of the cardboard collar strip will be based on how large your object is, but ideally you want around three extra inches of cardboard behind the object and around three inches or more above the piece. You'll then score the strip of cardboard down the center and fold it into an L shape as seen in the photo on the right. There. The height of the cardboard collar should leave enough room for poly sheeting to be wrapped tightly around the painting without the risk of it touching the face of the piece. Once you've made the L shape, then you can score the bottom part of the cardboard where you want to fold it to go under the object. Also, to make it easier, try to score with the cardboard's corrugation, not against it. It's much easier to score in the same direction than having to score over multiple parts of corrugation. Also, remember to not cut all the way through the cardboard. Here you can see how the, car how the corner is about to be creased. You can mark this section with a pencil and then take it to your workstation to make the crease with your blade or bone folder. Repeat this step on all four sides. Once you made the collar and secured the exterior edges with tape while being very careful of the frame, you'll need to wrap the piece in poly sheeting to protect it from the elements. To do this, pull the poly tightly around the cardboard collar and seal all edges with polyethylene or industrial tapes. The poly should be tight like a drum and it shouldn't sag in the middle or touch the object. Remember, these, uh, these tapes, the polyethylene and industrial tapes won't tear the poly when it's removed, but still be very cautious when using any tape near an unglazed object or canvas. Next on our list is soft packing. Soft packing is when an object is wrapped in something, well, soft, like blankets or bubble wrap for transport. Soft packing is the easiest method for packing framed objects with glazing. To soft pack a framed object, first cut a sheet of glassine to size to protect the frame's glazing. With this little guy. When packing with bubble wrap, the bubbles once again should always face out. Packing with bubbles facing in could leave little bubble impressions on some artifacts and glazing, so the bubbles should always face out to mitigate this risk. Also, always wrap objects so that they face up during the, during the entire packing process. You should never have to flip an object to, to pack it or unpack it. And this also helps to minimize overhandling. Folding the bubble wrap so that it can be open or unfolded without lifting the piece is important. For small soft packing, 
you can just fold the bubble wrap around the object so it's secure and can be easily unpacked. If you were to build a box, you should measure the object only once it has been soft packed so you can account for the added size of the wrapping. You can also combine soft pack and pinch pack methods for larger artworks. For these stable, newly framed objects, I first cut sheets of glassine to size to cover the glazing, just like for soft packing. Then I wrapped each piece in bubble wrap and secured the bubble with the low tack painter's tape to keep it in place. And that's the blue tape you can see on the sides. Then I measured the wrapped objects and cut sheets of double wall cardboard to the correct sizes for pinch packing. I used the same 10 point squares and tape tabs as before, but my squares here are larger and I used more top sheet tape in more spots to account for the larger size and to evenly pinch the cardboard in more places. So on the previous example, it, the tape was just in four spots. Here it's in four spots on every single side. Oh, I'm sorry to have you leave April, but thank you for coming. And once again, this will be on YouTube in about a week or so. So hopefully you can finish the webinar then. Thanks. Um, yeah, so when you combine these methods, um, for larger objects, and especially if you know that your objects might be traveling uh, upright, um, you can sometimes use uh, cardboard corners um, in your packing to make sure that the corners are safe during the entire trip. So that's what these white corners are on all of these. Our final packing method is box building. Sturdy boxes are immensely useful for storing and shipping a wide variety of objects, and knowing how to build a box of any size is a very useful skill. Here's how to build a box for a framed, soft-packed object. First, measure the objects while it's flat, while it's flat, with its length by its width. In this example, our soft-packed object will measure six inches by six inches. Next, you need to measure the depth of the object. Depth is hard to describe in a 2D diagram because it only exists in three dimensions. So here you can see the red arrows pointing to the length and the width in the photo on the left, the length and the width. Um, and in the uh, photo on the right is us measuring the depth. The length and the width are both six inches on this wrap square object. The photo on the right shows the depth from the uh, of its flat position on the table to the top of its bubble wrap. So here the depth is two inches. Now that you have your three dimensions, your length, your width, and your depth, you will use these numbers for determining your box base and lid measurements. First, take the depth of your wrapped object, which is two inches in this instance, and multiply that by two, which would make four. Then add the double depth of four inches to your flat dimensions to get the size of your box base. In this instance, six plus four equals 10. And this object is a square. So you need to cut a 10 inch by 10 inch square for your box base. Add five eighths of an inch to these measurements to get the dimensions of your box lid. Once you have your two measurements, you can cut your cardboard to size. The box lid needs to be larger than the base in order to fit snugly. The added 5 eighths of an inch accounts for the thickness of the cardboard plus the extra space needed to securely fit over the base. I usually make my boxes using double wall cardboard because it's more sturdy, but you can also use single wall cardboard for smaller objects or as temporary boxes. If you are using single wall cardboard, then only add on 3 eighths of an inch for your box lid. In this photo, we're using double walled, so we'll have one sheet cut to 10 inches by 10 inches and another sheet cut to 10 and 5 eighths by 10 and 5 eighths. To make the sides of your box, use your original depth measurement. Here, our original depth measurement was two inches, so we will score the cardboard two inches from the edges on all four sides. You can score the cardboard in a straight line using a ruler and a bone folder or with a scoring tool scissors, or a box cutter, but be careful once again to not cut all the way through the board. Also, always move your artifact a safe distance away before you score the cardboard. Never score with an artifact on your cardboard. 
Once all of your edges have been scored, cut out the corners on both sheets of cardboard and fold up the edges at your score marks to make the sides of your box. And here I am literally cutting corners. <laughs> Um, here you can see the cut squares in both photos. If you want to, you can also cut little tabs on two sides of your box lid square for easy grabbing when opening. Next, secure two corners of your box base and all four corners of your box lid with strapping and packing tapes. One piece of strapping and packing tape per corner should suffice for small boxes, but I recommend using more strips for larger and heavier boxes. Strapping tape, packing tape. Strapping tape is not strong enough to hold a corner by itself. Over time, it can fail, so always be sure to reinforce your strapping tape with packing tape for extra strength. Oh, and we have a new question here. Um, score inside of the fold, not the external part of the box, right? Yes, score inside the fold. Um, also, if you look at sheets of cardboard, they often have kind of two finishes on each side. And this is a good spot for me to point that out. Um, whenever I build my boxes, I try to have it so that the side where you can see more of the corrugation be the inside. And I tried to have the smoother side of the cardboard as the exterior. Um, honestly, because I just think it looks nicer. <laughs> um, but yes, score inside the fold, not in the external part. Um, here, the photo on the left shows a finished box base, and the photo on the right shows a finished box lid. We always leave two corners of the box base untaped to allow for easy access to the object and for easy removal from the box. This is especially important to have for fragile, flat, or larger artifacts. And now it's time to pack the box. This demonstration was for multiple items in a hand carry box, so the items are first wrapped in bubble wrap and secured with low tack painters tape. You should fill in any empty spaces in the box with more filling or bubble wrap to prevent the object from moving around while it's in the box. You want items to be snug, but not squished. Also, notice how the objects are, are on the other side of the box, away from my box cutter and tapes. Always remember to extract your box cutter blade when it's not in use to protect yourself and your artifacts. Remember, your packing goal should be clear and simple unpacking. Consider each layer carefully, make notes and instructions when necessary, and do your best to ensure the safety of your artifact which means label everything appropriately. And once again, here is um, a full photo set of the clear and simple unpacking. Um, so from left to right, we go from the almost completely packed box where the lid just came off, unwrapping the soft packing, wrapping the bubble, removing the glass scene, and then here is your easily accessed object. I also want to take a you with a quick note before we move on to our final step here. Um, these box building instructions in the previous slides work for boxes of any size. Here is another building example with larger dimensions. The photos here show that it still works for huge flat boxes and for tall book boxes as well. I'm currently in the process of building some very long boxes for panoramic photographs and thankfully these instructions haven't failed me yet. All right, so now we get to move on to our final handling it step. Shipping and transport even during a pandemic. Here in part five. Um, this is a photo of me packing a crate this summer, and it seems to perfectly sum up the current feelings about shipping in a pandemic. In this section, I will share our tips on how to make pickups and transports as safe as possible. And I'll also discuss some of our new procedures for in-person pickups, shipping via a common carrier, and shipping with art handlers. New policies and procedures.
With new COVID-19 safety guidelines popping up all the time, it is important to regularly evaluate and update your existing shipping policies and procedures. First, work with your team, hopefully via Zoom and not in person, to discuss new procedures that encourage social distancing and minimize in-person contact as much as possible. Here you can see our front door safety station. It's a one-stop shop where we can take our temperatures and get supplies as soon as we enter the building. We also put up new delivery and service visit handouts in this space to remind all of our staff about the new guidelines for socially distanced pickups and deliveries. Next, be aware of work from home days. While the majority of our administrative team is doing a fantastic job working remotely, the lab staff is working in shift schedules where each person is only in the lab two or three days a week and they're with the same team each time. For art handlers, preparators, registrars, and conservators, a schedule like this can be overwhelming, especially when you try to fit five days of packing into just two or three. To keep the work flowing, you sometimes must share the workload. Create accessible procedures and guidelines for receiving and releasing shipments when you are working from home. Assign reliable assistance to help you when you're not there and keep an open line of communication with your team before, during, and after a delivery. Planning ahead here is absolutely vital and communication is key. Next, you need to consider all aspects of a pickup or shipment, including signing the paperwork, the duration of the pickup, and disinfecting spaces once the object has left. We've developed separate procedures for each kind of shipment that I'll go over shortly, but it's important to think through each step in advance as well. Fill out as much paperwork as you can digitally with your recipient via email, for instance. Also, don't be afraid to revise these procedures later if you have found a better way. Once again, clear communication is key. Stay in touch with your colleagues via calls, texts, emails, Zoom, Slack, or Microsoft Teams, or your preferred messaging service of choice to ensure everyone is on the same page and aware of new shipments. And now I will go through three different kinds of shipping, including in-person collections, shipping with a common carrier like FedEx or UPS, and finally shipping with art handlers. So first, in-person collections. Previously, our clients were able to look at their finished objects during pickup and talk directly to a conservator about their recent treatments. Now we're trying to do everything we can digitally. In advance of the pickup, I'll email the recipient a copy of their final treatment report and outgoing receipt. The outgoing receipt will clearly detail the number of packages to be collected, the pack dimensions, the weight of the package if needed, and any additional packing notes. This email also opens up a line of communication with the recipient and helps to prepare them for their pickup. It also allows them a space to ask questions about their recently treated object. In the follow-up scheduling email that I will then send, I pass along our new, pack, our new pickup instructions. These instructions include notes about wearing a mask at all times and who to call upon arrival. Clients can either go to our front door where they will be buzzed in and asked to wait in the vestibule, or we will meet them in our back parking lot with their objects. If they come to the front door, they must remain in the vestibule, in the vestibule near a small pickup table where, where we will then bring down their objects and it can be retrieved. The small table has a clipboard with their outgoing documents all ready for them to sign and a courtesy bottle of hand sanitizer nearby. After they sign the documents and leave, the clipboard, pen, door handles, and anything else they might have encountered are disinfected. In this scenario, this pickup usually takes less than five minutes. Oh, I'm not quite done with the slide yet. If the client drives to the center to pick up their object, they are instructed to call a designated assistant upon arrival and wait in the parking lot for their package. We will bring down their object and any forms on a clipboard for them to sign and do a socially distanced outdoor pickup near their vehicle. Masks must also be worn at all times outside and everything is once again disinfected after the client leaves. This outdoor pickup usually requires two staff to assist with carrying objects and opening doors but the streamlined method has also reduced this pickup time to less than five minutes. Releasing objects outside may sound like a wild idea, 
but this has been successful for us because of our meticulous preparation and clearly stated instructions. Well, there is another factor to consider when releasing objects outside, but secure, securely wrapping packages in poly and being flexible with your client's pickup schedules has worked for us so far. Now the next slide. Using a common carrier like FedEx or UPS. Our common carrier procedures have also been altered by the pandemic. If an object is to be shipped from the center, we first schedule the shipment with the client to ensure that they will be open first and ready to receive on the delivery day. Once that has been confirmed, I'll create a standard overnight shipment and send the tracking number and outgoing receipt to the recipient. When creating the shipment, I'll also include the recipient's email address in the alert section to ensure that they receive periodic emails directly from the carrier as the shipment progresses. When shipping via a common carrier, I always recommend overnight shipping with a direct signature required upon arrival. We want artifacts, once again, to be handled as little as possible, and overnight shipments are the best way to prevent overhandling. Do not schedule an overnight shipment on a Friday, as the package is more likely to stay in a warehouse over the weekend and experience dramatic humidity and temperature fluctuations. On the scheduled pickup day, we place the object in a safe but easily accessible location for the carrier to retrieve it. We have also made additional signage for our common carrier shippers like please be patient for our staff to come to the door and do not leave packages unattended. Because there are fewer people in the lab each day, we've also set up baby monitors near our front door buzzers and throughout the lab so all staff can hear the doorbell when it rings. It has been a simple but incredibly effective method for releasing and receiving common carrier shipments. However, there have been a few more concerns with common carriers recently regarding masks and signatures. More, on more than one occasion, I've had to remind our FedEx or UPS carrier to put on their mask when they enter the building or um, when, when they come in to deliver a package or pick something up. I've also noticed that some drivers are not dropping off items without obtaining a signature, even when a direct signature has been requested. In these instances, you have to speak up and demand they comply with the new procedures. Ask them to wear their mask properly and insist on obtaining a signature for all packages containing objects. You must be vigilant and speak up if you notice anything. All right, we're almost to the end. One more slide. Thank you for sticking with me. Here we go, the last one, using an art shipper. We've combined our in-person and common carrier guidelines for any art shipper shipments. When scheduling an art shipper, I will send them a packing list in advance with all of the pack dimensions and weights if necessary. I also send them to our in-person, I also send them our in-person instructions list about where to pick up and our mask requirements. Most art handlers will now send along a client safety agreement in advance of a pickup or a delivery. These agreements affirm that the staff has been properly trained on social distancing guidelines and proper PPE usage. You will have to agree to the shipper's requirements when you send along your pickup instructions. You should also share your PPA guidelines at that same time. Read these agreements carefully and make sure both parties can work under these mutual guidelines. If you've hired art handlers to pack your objects before shipping, do not hesitate to ask questions about their new procedures like, do the handlers work in designated teams to reduce person-to-person -person contact? Once the packing or shipment has been scheduled with your art shipper, make a plan for a safe and quick pickup and delivery. If they will be packing, stage the objects in a designated space away from other staff and only have one staff member, if possible, oversee the packing. Make sure all parties practice social distancing and wear appropriate PPE for the entire duration of the project. You should strive to have them stay in the building for as little time as possible while keeping your objects safe. Have additional PPE available like masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer, and you can also request temperature checks for the packing team upon arrival. If you witness anything that violates the agreed upon client safety agreement, like improper mask usage, speak up immediately. The safety of your artifacts is a priority, but so is the health and safety of you and your staff. These client safety agreements only work when both parties follow the guidelines, so it's important to ask questions in advance and speak up when necessary. And that is it. Congratulations, you are now qualified to handle 
just about anything. I hope these five steps clarified some of your handling and packing questions. And I just wanna thank you all so much for taking the time to be here today. Um, I will leave you with this helpful list of archival material suppliers. And I also want to just say um, a big thank you to my mother in particular. Um, she is in Oklahoma and we will not be able to see each other this holiday, um, but I am very grateful that she was able to tune in today and learn a bit about packing. Um, so yeah, now uh, I, I think I was able to answer most of the questions during the webinar. If you have any more, um, I am happy to answer them now. And once again, thank you all so much. Ooh, okay, I see a couple questions coming in. Bubble wrap question. Is it okay to use for long-term storage as long as it does not directly touch the objects? I'm thinking, for instance, of porcelain boxes in our collections. Could they be wrapped in acid-free tissues and bubble wrap for long-term storage? Um, can frame material be wrapped in bubble wrap for long-term storage? Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, so I would be incredibly hesitant to use bubble wrap for long-term storage, even with a protective barrier first. Um, plastics can degrade very quickly. Bubble wrap is the same and the bubbles will deflate over time. Um, if you do use bubble wrap for a little bit, or um, I mean, you could even consider changing it out. Uh, instead, I would lean more heavily towards more archival, archival materials like Falara or um, like poly sheeting or some other way, just because I think the bubble wrap will fail you faster than you imagine. Um, Oh, and I see another note here from Elizabeth. She says bubble has dust in the air pockets too, which can transfer to the objects. And she is exactly right. Um, so that is another factor to take into consideration. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Let me see if there's any other questions. Oh, a question about glassine and photographs. Since glassine has a risk of damaging photographs for potential sticking, um, what is the preferred method to cover it? Um, glassine, or sorry, not glassine, photographs, I would actually encourage putting into um, an archival box made out of that alkaline buffered blue board. Um, the photograph can sit directly in the box um, or the photograph uh, could be placed into a um, storage folder made out of either the alkali blue board or alkaline blue board or um, the buffered folder stock. So I would do those first for photographs in particular. Um, what do I think about Dartec for long-term wrapped paintings? Um, I honestly haven't used Dartec a lot. Um, Dartec tends to be pretty expensive. Um, and as you can tell, I am just very grateful to my cardboard and inexpensive packing materials on occasion. Um, Dartec isn't bad though. Um, from what I've heard, it is actually, um, a pretty good material, very similar to um, Tyvek. Um, but I might have to do a bit more research about Dartec in particular, just because I haven't used it a ton. Um, oh yeah, photo text paper is also good for interleaving with photos. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, someone else said, um, has a question about a collections move plan. Where can I get such a thing in order to design my own plan? Um, there are some really great webinars about um, collections moves in particular on the FAIC website. Um, you might have to become a, web a member to access them though, um, but I think uh, there are some other resources and maybe Stephanie can help me out if I can't remember them off the top of my head about um, collection move webinars. Um, so check out FAIC. Um, Stephanie, do you know of any other um, recent webinars about collections moves? I don't know about webinars, Adriana, but I am currently um, pasting into the chat box a technical bulletin that we have oh, on the perfect. website at CCAHA. Um, give me just one second here to finish typing it in and, and that might be a good starting point for you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So yeah, sure. check out, uh, yeah, if you can check out um, our, our guidelines for that information. Also, our website has a ton of information about um, conservation and preservation services and um, 
materials and housing and framing and sealed packages. So a lot of times, if you just search through the CCAHA website, you can find some excellent resources right in there. All right. Thank you guys so much. I think I was able to answer most of the questions. If you have anything else, I am happy to answer them for a little bit longer. I know that we are uh, coming up on quite a bit of time, but I really appreciate you all for sticking in there with me. And um, I'm so glad to hear that you liked it. Thank you so much. Adriana, is it okay if I type your email into the chat box in case folks get a question later in the day or later in the week? Yes, of course. Please okay, do. Yep, that is Thanks my email. Send yeah, thank you for being such a resource and for spending so much time with our audience today and for sharing your expertise. Much appreciated. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Thanks. I'll close up Bye. the meeting now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.